Welcome to the video services of Salem Primitive Baptist Church, located in Graysville, Arkansas. I would like to thank you for joining us and pray that you are blessed and worshiping with us. I would also like to invite you to come and visit us in person and join in. We have worship service every Sunday morning at 1030 and Bible study every Wednesday night at 630. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel for the most current updates. You can find links to them and more information about us on our website at www.salempbchurch.com. Thank you again, and may you be blessed in the knowledge of our God and Father. Bible with you this morning. I encourage you to open to the book of Ezra, chapter 3. The book of Ezra, chapter 3, is where I want to try to continue our thoughts this morning. Last week we uh, began looking at this section of scripture trying to understand uh, the pathway to recovery. Last week we began looking at the, our current standing and understanding and knowing that uh, last year was hard. There were issues that come about that we never thought we would see. Uh, we're still seeing things come about that I never thought I would see come across. I knew that the nation was struggling and there was all kinds of turmoil going on, but I... And I worried about how January 6th was going to go. But did I imagine seeing a man dressed as a buffalo standing in Congress? No. We're still seeing things that we never imagined we would see. I, I started off last week with reminding you that the truly... There is a precursor to our path to recovery. And that is the fact that we are the people that are not supposed to stop. We are the people that are not supposed to cease. We've been looking at this section of scripture in Ezra, which is using the people of Israel as an example during their Babylonian captivity and the time they're coming out of that captivity, that time of absolute turmoil where God said that it was uh, had not been ba this bad prior to that time. It was truly a time of struggle and pain and suffering for you to be drawn out of your nation, for those to literally try to wipe you off the face of the earth, destroy the country you came from, remove all teaching and understanding, change your names, change your teachings, try to remove the history in the past. Scary almost how much sounds familiar. But God told them during that time, don't stop. Marry, build houses, have children, plant vineyards, and pray for the peace of the nation that you are in. No matter how contrary it may be, no matter how lost we may feel in it, an alien, we may feel in it from time to time. God says, pray for the peace of the nation, for in its peace will you find peace. So truly, that's the precursor to our recovery. If we are going to bring ourselves to the point of recovering from this, how many of us really want to see a recovery in the Lord's church? How many of us are ready and willing to recognize that we need recovery? Yes. We need it. God's people that are called by His name, that are willing to walk in His paths, that are willing to stand for His truths, 
that are willing to be the pillar and the ground of the truth, the assembly by the name of the church. Y'all notice I left PB off that. God's people need recovery. Yes. We're beat up. I know we're tired. I know things are hard. And I'm not telling you that's going to change. But the reality is we can change in it. If we are going to get ourselves to the point of reaching this path of recovery, we have to be those that do not stop. We do not give up. We do not cease. We continue to get married. We continue to have children. Literally, we continue to follow the paths of Scripture that started with marriage, that started with have children, that started with raise your children, Plant vineyards, plant gardens, build houses, continue the generations. That's where it started. That's where it's got to continue. And we've got to be those that continue in those paths if we have any hope of recovery. Amen. That's what God told Israel to do during their time of captivity. He will bless even in the struggles. Read the book of Job. No man suffered like Job. And God blessed him through it, carried him through it, and on the other side, he was better off than he was going into it. God is still with us. Amen. And I began looking here in Ezra, read with me in the third chapter. This is now, Israel is coming out of their captivity. They're making their way back into what's left of the nation. They're making their way back into a nation that's full of rubble and trash. This is not, they didn't walk back into a, a metropolis that's built and ready to go. This is not as it was when Israel went into the promised land the first time and drove out the people of the land and God said that there are houses that you didn't build and cities that you didn't build and gardens that you didn't plant and vineyards that you didn't plant that you're going to be able to enjoy the blessings of. They're coming into it now, it's destroyed. It's rubble. Go look at Nehemiah. They had to first clean the trash out and clean up all the rubble and remove all the stuff that was in the way of building the wall. Get the picture. Understand what's going on here. And they're starting to come back into the nation, and that's where we're at here in the third chapter. Starting in verse 1. And when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. And that's where we were last week. And I have no intentions of re-preaching that, but I want to remind us again as we go through this, the paths to recovery. Step one is the remembering of the importance of us to gather together. If the church, if the people of God have any hope of recovery, we've got to remember how important church is. Amen. We have got to remember how important, imperative, without replace, all the way to the point that Paul puts it in Hebrews, it is sinful to neglect the assembly of the house of God. In Hebrews, when he says to forsake not the assembly, that is not those that intermittently miss because of issues or problems. If you've got an ox in the ditch, Christ said it's okay to skip the Sabbath. If you're sick, stay home. We have a replacement. We have a substitute. But understand that this is a substitute for those who cannot be here. I am thankful for our streaming services. I tweaked on it a lot this weekend trying to make it run smoother and work better. I'm thankful for that. But it is not a replacement for the assembly. When Paul says to forsake not the assembly, he's not talking about those that have something that come up and they miss a Sunday or two. He's talking about those that say it's not important. He's talking about those that say, it's, I don't have to. It, that's not part of Christianity. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. That is so foreign from Scripture, it's not even funny. For a Christian to say that it's not important to go to church, is it is just as foreign to Scripture as I saved myself for heaven. It is just that foreign from Scripture. 
To forsake the assembly is to say church is of no importance. I can serve God from my living room just as well as I can there. No, you can not. Step one is for God's people to stop thinking this is optional. Step one is they came together as one man in the unity of seeking God. That was step one. This morning, though, I want to continue on looking at our next step. Continue on in the reading. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Jezadik, and his brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of the God of Israel, to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they set the altar upon his bases, for fear was upon them, because of the people those, of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. They kept also the feast of tabernacles as it is written and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the custom as the duty of every man required. And afterward offered the continual burnt offering both of the new moons and of all the set feasts to the Lord that were consecrated and of every one that willingly offered a freewill offering unto the Lord. I want to stop there. The people of Israel came back into the land. And they gathered themselves together. This all happens together, but I want us to see that this is our path to recovery. This is what it takes for us to move forward and to come back together as we should. Israel gathered themselves together as one man into Jerusalem. And when they gathered together in unity, and this is why you cannot serve God at home or in a deer stand or in a boat or on vacation or driving up and down the road the same as you can in church. What happened when they gathered together? When they gathered together, somebody stood up and went to the front of the room and began to teach. God had sent the priest before his people and they began to teach the people what needed to happen. It takes a minister to have church. Husbands, fathers, you are called on to teach your children from the word of God. But you are not a replacement for the ministry. Ministers are not a replacement for husbands and fathers. I can't teach your children. I don't see them enough. This takes all of us. Church is not a replacement for home worship and home worship is not a replacement for church. Please understand that whole other subject and I got to leave that rabbit alone the priest stood up before them this is just kind of a, a little subtopic of the next step but the fact of the matter is if the church wants to recover this puts a whole lot of fear and trembling in my knees and I'm thankful for big pulpits that cover that up the fact of the matter is if God's church is going to recover it's going to require God's ministers to stand up and teach the truth whether y'all like to hear it or not well boy that preacher sure is stepping all over my toes you probably need it because I guarantee he's stomping all over his own when he does it. If the church is going to recover, it's going to require the ministers to stand up. Those that God has called to preach to stand up and not worry about what the world says. Not worry about what's going on around and outside of them. I promise you, the land laid fallow, but that doesn't mean nobody was there. 
The other nations had come in and taken over. They ruled the place. It had just been taken over by whoever wanted to be there. And they didn't like Israel coming back into it. We're going to see that later on. They didn't like Israel coming back in. I promise you, this world's not going to like it if the church actually starts doing its job. The world's not going to like it if we actually start acting like Christians. And the ministers must not slink back from that. Too much of today's Christianity is self-help and wealth and happy, healthy, and blessed if you believe, and that does nothing for nobody. The ministers have to stand up, and the people have to listen. But they began to offer sacrifice. They immediately... They hadn't started building the church building yet. They hadn't put the walls back up yet. They hadn't started feeding the poor. They hadn't started trying to heal the sick. They hadn't started doing any of that yet. Their first thing to do, the first thing they did when they gathered themselves together is they built an altar and they began to seek God. That is the primary focus of the church. So many people, when you talk, well, why do you go where you go? Why is it that you like it? Well, they do such and such for the, for the poor, and they do such and such for the community, and they do such. That's great. That's good. But that is secondary. That comes after the fact that you tell me that that church's primary focus is praising God. That is the primary focus. That should be the main thing you look for. Do they teach you the truth? That is step one. They hadn't started doing any of the rest of that yet. The first thing they did is they built an altar. And I love the way he words this. The first thing they did, verse 2, about halfway through so we can skip the names that nobody likes to read. They builded the altar of the God of Israel. But notice it was not for show. They didn't build it together just to say, look how big and pretty ours is. They built the altar of the God of Israel for the purpose of burning offerings on it. They intended to do something with this. They had an intent for building this. They built the altar and they began sacrificing. They began giving up. They began seeking God. We can see this as the pattern throughout Scripture. You can go again all the way back to Adam and Eve. What were Cain and Abel doing? They were offering sacrifice on the altar. I, I went through this with y'all. Hard to believe it's been well over two years ago now. But I went through all of this with y'all. Showing you that this is when these boys had become men and they were now going into their life and their mom and dad had done the job and had taught them the first thing you do is you start seeking God. And that's what they were doing. They had built their altars. They were going out to seek their own and to do their own and they brought the first fruits. Important there. They brought the first fruits and they gave that sacrifice to God. That was the first thing they were to do for God to bless them in their life. That's what's going on there. And Abel's life was going good and Cain's life didn't seem so great because God had respect unto one and not the other. And again, can't chase rabbits. But step one for them, they built an altar and they started sacrificing. Fast forward a few thousand years and you see Noah. It baffles me people trying to figure out why they can't find the ark. It baffles me people trying to figure out. Well, you would think something that big you'd be able to find it. You know what Noah did on day one when his feet hit dry ground? He took an axe to the ark. He started busting it up. Day one, if you go back and read in Genesis, and we're not going to read it just for the saving of time, but you'll find there in Genesis, when he came off the boat, the first thing he did was 
He built an altar before the Lord and he offered sacrifice unto God. They're, they've made it through the hard time. His family of eight gathered together. The only eight souls that lived through that hard time. It can be worse than what we're going through. The eight that had lived through it, they gathered together. And Noah, as the patriarch, as the prophet, as the priest at that time, sorry, gathered together and he built an altar. And this is why there were seven of the clean and not the unclean. When we think about the ark and we look at the pictures, it's always Noah and the two by two animals all around. There were seven of the clean animals. Ever wondered why there was an odd number? Guess what happened to number seven when they got off the boat? He was sacrificed to God. First thing. He began to offer sacrifice and God spoke to Noah and showed him the bow in the sky. The first thing he did as he began offering to God. And God answered that sacrifice. This is the pattern. You see it with Moses as they come out. You see over and over how he built altars all over the place. They named cities based on the altar that was there. And the, the interaction they had with God. You see it with Israel here. They began building the altars and they began offering and they began keeping the law of Moses and they began keeping the law to the jot and to the tittle as best that they could. They started following and seeking God. And many of you are looking at me, well, that's great, brother. But what's that got to do with us? I know you're not going to tell me to go in my backyard and build an altar and go out there and kill Fido so we can put him on the altar, right? No, I'm not. But this is still the pattern today. Go with me to the book of Acts. Chapter 2. We're trying to compare the two to try to see that this is still the pattern today. I want you to understand our sacrifice. Because no, I'm not telling you to go out there and bust the church up and so you've got wood to burn and pile up rocks and we need to put an altar out there in front of the church so we can start sacrificing bulls and oxen and turtle doves and all of those things. One, I, I don't want to do all of that. And two, it's not necessary. But this is still step two. To offer sacrifice. We looked at this a little bit last week, seeing how they came together. In the first chapter, it, it tells us that they were all gathered together, an assembly of 120 I always want to put this plug in there for all of us. It was an assembly, man and women, young and old. They weren't divided. They weren't segregated, weren't split off according to age groups so that they can learn better. They were assembled together, all in one accord, praying and seeking God, just as they were in Israel. And God begins to answer those prayers. And we look in chapter 2, in verse 14, and you're going to see what happens when everybody gathers together. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. And I'll read all of it. What happened? They're gathered together. They're assembled, they're assembled in unity, seeking God. And the preacher stands up. The minister stands up before the people. All 12 of them come to the front. And Peter steps out in front of them and says, Time to listen. Sound familiar? The minister stood up. I'm not going to read the entirety of the, the sermon. It's a really good one. But we're going to fast forward on down to verse 33 of the same chapter. Uh, Peter proceeds to stand up before all of these uh, Jews from many different nations gathered together uh, just as they were there in Israel. 
They were all gathered together and Peter proceeds to preach a very good sermon on Jesus Christ. He begins back in Israel's old time and shows how they had gone through life and how God had worked with them all for the purpose of bringing forth Jesus. Y'all know that was the primary focus of Israel? Yes. Was the bringing forth of Jesus. That was their purpose. And they had done that. And this was fresh on their minds. This is not far removed from the crucifixion. This is very shortly removed from Christ's ascension. And they are gathered together and everybody is listening. And Peter gets all the way down here to verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith to himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Brothers well, sisters, there was a sacrifice that took place right there. It's the sacrifice that we have today. It's the sacrifice that we have to present now if we intend to recover we don't put forth the blood of lambs and bullocks. We don't put forth the blood of turtle doves. I don't even put forth the blood of Christ. That's done. But when Peter preached to the assembly, when the people gather themselves together, when we begin to recover and we begin doing the work and provoke in love and good works to others that they will gather together here. And the minister stands up, what's he supposed to preach about? Christ. Charles Spurgeon said, it doesn't matter what uh, subject you pick, you pick it and you run as fast as you can to the cross. I'm not here to preach Spurgeon, but he's, I really enjoy reading his writings. Whatever the subject may be, I'm talking to you about recovery. I want you to know that recovery is based on Christ. Whatever the subject is, the minister runs as fast as he can to Jesus Christ and Him crucified because that is indeed our focus. And when the people gather themselves together and the minister stands before them and begins to preach these things, they were pricked in, in their heart. It had an effect. It broke their heart. This is the sacrifice that I'm talking about. We see this spoken about in Old Testament. I don't mean to make you just turn all over in your scripture, but it's good for you to know the places anyway. Isaiah chapter 1 talks about this sacrifice that we are supposed to be presenting as we try to recover. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. Just make notes if you'd like. But Isaiah chapter 1 starting in verse 10 says, Hear the words of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of her God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? God said by this time, I'm tired of them. I'm not listening to them anymore. I've had all of that I can take. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. 
And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. What would he rather have? Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, through your sins. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. I would rather have your chain. Than have all of the bullets and the blood of rams and lambs and he goats. I would rather have them. I would rather have you change. The New Testament time, our church, the church to recover is not a, a focus of growing a, a bigger number of those that are assembled. The, the church recovering is not. Just about making sure the name is out there more and more. The church recovering is us gathering together, seeking God with a broken heart, wanting to change. If we are going to change, it has to start somewhere. It has to begin with something. And it begins in the self-same place that it started with all those that were gathered. Y'all remember how many were added that day? When they were pricked in the heart, 3,000 were added that day. That change started with something. And that change started with a breaking of the heart, a sacrifice of a contrite spirit. Uh, that's found in uh, Psalms 51. In 17, it says, this, uh, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are of a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. What sacrifice are we looking for today? For to break our heart. Offer up the sacrifice of a... Of a Penitent heart. A contrite spirit. And if you look that word up, that, that's not a, a just a hurting spirit. Contrite is broken, bruised, smashed. I mean, literally crushed. When those people that were gathered together heard about how God had been working through their lives and they should have recognized the Messiah. They should have seen that that was Jesus. They should have been able to recognize that God truly had kept His promises and sent the Messiah to come and to save them and to work with them. And instead of that, instead of that being how it happened, instead of them being those that recognized just as it says there in John, to as many as received him, gave he power to become the sons of God. It, that's how it should have been. They're sitting there listening about a Jesus that they saw and they spat upon. They hear about a Jesus that bore their sins on the cross and they should have recognized and praised and said, No! Kill Barabbas, give us Jesus. Instead, we had it backwards and it broke them. For the church to recover, we have got to be those that hear about Jesus Christ and knock off the scale of the callous of we've heard this all our life of how good Jesus is and he's taken all of our sins and that actually start meaning something to us again. Jesus was broken, beaten, bloodied, and nailed to the cross because of me. 
and that start meaning something to us again. That it's not just, I've heard it before, give me something new. For it to prick us in the heart and drive us to change. The sacrifice that God is looking for is that of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Of one that recognizes how we've done wrong. When they were coming out of Israel and they were gathering together and they began offering the sacrifices. As that blood poured out on that altar and run down to the ground as they started setting it on fire. They should be able to see that this is what we deserve. We have brought this on ourselves, that burning and that blood that shed. That should be me. It was pointing towards Christ. And us on the New Testament looking back on it should be able to look back on what Jesus did and recognize that should be me. I should be the one that God turned his back on. I should be the one that experiences death and hell. I should be the one that pays for my sins. I'm the one that did them. I'm the one that committed them. God, I'm going to do better. I'm going to change. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to apply myself to your service. I'm going to try to be the Christian you've called me out to be. I'm going to try to live up to where I don't feel that so much. God, you've been so good to me. I want to be good for you. That's the sacrifice that we have got to present in order to recover. Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 12. Of how this is a lifelong sacrifice. The sacrifice that we have got to get back to presenting. If we are going to recover, this is the starting point. The starting point is we begin to sacrifice to God. And seeking His face. Romans chapter 12 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. If you can remember there in Ezra, they began with those required sacrifices. They began with the new moons and all of those things. Then at the end they said they gave of their increase. They gave even more. But they started with just what's reasonable. They started with just what was commanded. What is just reasonable for us to be sacrificing to God is our life. Our every breath. That is just, the to put that into today's language, it's the least you can do. When, when you do something for somebody and they say, oh, thank you so much. Oh, it's just the least I could do. That's the equivalent here. If God was willing to send forth his son to give up his literal life for you, the least you can do is live for him. That is the very least you can do. And Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. I beg you. I implore you. I exhort you. I earnestly want you to listen and to respond to this. By the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. We've got it so much better in the New Testament. You don't have to kill yourself for God. He's not calling on you to die for Him. He's not calling you to, to have no life. He's calling on you to have a life you live for Him. To present your everything to Him. You see this in so many different places in Scripture. Uh, Jesus talked about it. When He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. They gathered together and the first thing they did was they sacrificed. When you get up in the morning, seek God. 
When you go to work, seek God. When you deal with your children that are driving you crazy and they're doing the same thing over and over and over again and you want to nail them to the wall, seek God. When you're dealing with your marriage, seek God. And please, when you gather together here, seek God, not yourself. That's why it is so important for us to gather together. It's for Him to speak to us. I don't feel worthy of that still to this day. You remember asking a, a father in the ministry the night before I had hands laid on me. When did you stop doubting? He said, I never have. But the day I quit questioning is when men I loved were willing to lay their hands on me and say they see something. He said, I don't question anymore. But I still doubt it. I don't feel worthy of that place. But we gather together to seek God. And to be as those that were listening and be pricked in the heart. It's supposed to hurt sometimes. And we're supposed to use that, that pain and that sensation that you should be very thankful for. You know what it means that those brethren and sisters were pricked in the heart? They were children of God. We hear about a king later that was pricked to the heart, but it didn't have a change. Does that mean he wasn't a born-again child of God? Not necessarily. I fear too much that, that we are, as children of God, just like I said, we've, we've sat under the sound of the gospel so long that we've become callous to it that hearing about Jesus being crucified only makes it to our heart and doesn't prick us all the way in anymore. I pray to God that it continues to prick us in the heart. Because the only way that it can is if God's taken that stony heart out of us and He's given us a heart of flesh that we can feel Him. As born again children of God, we need to be thankful for a broken heart. We couldn't have it without Him. That sounds self-defeating and that sounds like we're a glutton for punishment almost. But I tell you, we need to be thankful for the pain. We need to be thankful to be able to feel the pain of Jesus being crucified. The next step for us, if we're going to continue this road to recovery, is to be willing to be under the sound of the gospel. And we need to seek God. We need to be like those that were there in Israel and we seek Him daily, we seek Him morning and night, and we seek Him first. And we see to it that we do all of it. They Not only did they add the sacrifices, they added the solemn feasts, and the new moons. They began following the commandments of God again. What did Jesus say about disciples? If... You follow my commandments. Then are you my disciples indeed. God says be a member of the church. God says get baptized. That's not an offering. God says that we're supposed to do this in remembrance of me. We need to be taking part in the communion service. We need to be learning his word. And we need to be following His Word. We need to start with that which is the least, and that's our life, and get around to those like Israel who are free and willing to give the more. 
this is all about us Christians growing up. Step one is to start seeking Him. And grow up. And give Him of the increase. Of your heart. Of your mind. Of your body. Of your all. Only in this will we continue to recover. Thank you. And God bless. I will sing the wondrous story of the cross. Thank you again for joining us at Salem Primitive Baptist Church. I pray that the Word of God may brightly shine in your lives. If you would like to contact us or would like to download a copy of today's message, please go to www.salempbchurch.com. God bless you all. Who died for me? Sing His with the saints in glory. The saints in glory. Gathered by, Gathered by the crystal sea. The crystal sea.